you see them along the roads and in the villages and everything, just, just either they're tethered or they have someone with them. Mm -hmm. And even along the busy roads, it really amazes me, all these cars and boda bodas and bikes and foot traffic going by, and the animals are just like, oh well, we know not to go on the road. They just stay on the side of the road and they'll eat along the side, even mm -hmm. though they don't, they're not, um, chained to anything or tied up to anything. And in Kampala, they're not tethered. They just, they, that's in the city. They just go eat where they want and they come home at night. And then they'll tether them in the villages to keep them out of their gardens. And so they make, that's the thing they would do on the farm is make sure the goats don't get in the rice and the maize and the crops. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a lot of land. There's, yeah. they're not gonna be a really a problem. Yeah. Right. There's plenty to eat there. Yeah, I think you have a question. Yeah, just a question on kind of general climate. Um, is there a seasons or is it yeah. pretty much subtropical or what? There's two rainy seasons and we got there, well, June is the last month of their rainy season. So we left here at uh, the very beginning of June here and the weather was, you know, 70s and kind of rainy and stuff. We got there and it was just like, uh, is this Africa? Because it was basically the same. Really? Yeah, yeah. it's a little warmer. A little, little warmer. bit warmer, yeah. Um, it only rains like once a day, and it rains hard. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of rain. Well, the day we were out at the one farm where the red, uh, <laughs> I mean, the mud stuck to your shoes this much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but even on the, go on the farm there, there was mud when they were working. But, you know, um, but it's, uh, let's see, when we got to Kent, when we got to Nairobi, which is just pretty much across, I saw the latitude was one, one it's latitude one. <laughs> okay. So we're, you're just right on uh, south of the equator. So it was one, uh, what do we call latitude one degree south of the equator in Nairobi, and, and um, Kampala is just about the same. So you're, uh, it, it's daylight at um, at six thirty. Seven a.m. Yeah. yeah, and it gets dark at six thirty. It's like six thirty to six thirty. You're right in there, pitch dark by seven, and light. It's so it's starting to get light by six thirty in the morning. That's when you first get your light, and uh, every day, every day, the whole year round, and um, and it's warm. You know, we would say perfect weather, seventies, eighties, late upper seventies and eighties. Not, and every time it would just feel like it was going to get hot. I know Mary had, you had your hat, and you guys were out on the farm, so you got more of it. But it would then, the clouds would kind of come in, and it, and by the time I got out there, like five, it's cooling. It was cooling down. Nights were easy to sleep. But you did feel like a princess. It, in, um, in Uganda, you had to have your um, mosquito nets. Over and your bed. So every net had the canopy. Um, I, when we got to Kenya, we didn't have that. Uh, in Nairobi, I asked, and, and Keith said, well, we're a mile high. Right. <laughs> okay, a mile high in Nairobi. You don't need mosquito nets. You're not gonna get the same. So that was the one difference between um, Kenya and, um, you know, Nairobi and Kampala was um, the elevation. But otherwise, um, beautiful. I mean, plant, uh, trees are growing. <laughs> Oh, in season, but you have mangoes, uh, just pick off the tree, and they eat them like apples. You can eat the peeling, uh, you can just eat the whole mango. Um, they peel them for us, <laughs> but you don't have to. And then um, avocados, big avocados, uh, seven kinds of bananas, um, but the little short ones, we just could go down, you know, uh, basically, you could roll down the window of the van and buy it right on the street. Somebody would be selling these little bananas. And so that was part of our evening snack. We decided we didn't eat dinner in the evenings. Did you tell them that? Well, I told them about eating the rock cabbage. And yeah. they fed us so well at lunchtime. And then at dinner, they wanted to feed us well again. We're like, we're gonna weigh like 40 pounds more when we go home, <laughs> and especially if we haven't been doing physical labor, you know? Well, so for me, it, it's beans and rice at lunch and beans and rice at dinner. <laughs> All right, I can, I can skip dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we would usually, we got to the point where we're like, no, we don't need dinner. We'll just do our little snacking in the evening and we'll sleep a lot better when we're not so full of food. 
So do they have ducks and geese and yeah. chickens on the farm? Yeah. Well, not on the farm, but in the villages in the city. Yeah, you, you'd always hear roosters crowing. And, uh, and it might be a turkey. Are, also, they have turkeys. Yeah, right by the guest house in mm -hmm. Kampala. They do they eat them? Turkeys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I remember when you, when you showed us the picture of the slum areas. Uh, well, private right, Right, I didn't have some pictures here, but yeah. is that the majority of the population living there? Mm -hmm. uh, if they're not in the rural area, not in the school. Yeah, See, the five of the schools are in. Um, well, actually, <coughs> only three of them are in <coughs> rural areas, like out where the farm is. And like, did you have a picture? You, you know, showed us that one, the trading post. Um, Yeah, you do that one kind of way. That's the church is there. So that's what the that's what the rural area looked like. Um, these would be shops. Um, in here would be a shop, and then uh, at night they pull all their stuff in that they're selling and they sleep in there. That's their house and their shop. Um, however, that building had been purchased by the school. So this one is a classroom, and it's, you go in from the back. They walled up the doors that would be the shop door, and and, uh, and they cemented the floor. Last year was a dirt floor. Uh, four years ago, when Carol Woody came to one of these rural schools with a dirt floor, they were putting manure. So the, the director of the school was spreading manure on the floor to keep the kids from getting chiggers, uh, because they were, they were going barefoot, they were getting chiggers in their feet, and they were they couldn't concentrate on their studies, and they were their feet were infected. When Carol saw that she was um, that they were spreading manure on the floor, and the children were going to school with manure on the floor, oh, she my. said, "This is not happening." <laughs> so oh, she came home. That started the sponsorship program. She came home and started getting sponsors for these children and shoes and socks. And yeah. so every every child for fifteen dollars gets. Um, a pair of shoes uh, for fifteen dollars a year. They get a pair of shoes and a pair of socks, and and they by the end of the year they're looking pretty worn, but it works. Um, they get a uniform for fifty dollars in this rural schools. Fifty dollars a year gives them their uniform, their tuition, and um, two meals. They get their porridge and then the beans and rice. In the town schools, which are two of those, um, it costs a hundred dollars for a year for these kids, but the same thing, and the shoes. But with dirt, you know, and now they've all those schools that have dirt floors now have cement. This year, last year, they were able to pour cement, have cement floors, and now that the children's feet are, you know, have shoes on, they're not getting the, wow. the chiggers that they were. But this, this is a picture of what the rural area looks like. And um, it'll just be a few shops, and then, then what will be is the houses. <coughs> Um, and they are just more like down here, like yeah. that one. We're just a, a window and a door and just a little square box. Yeah, but that's a lot nicer though. Yeah. Sure. yeah, it's better than what is in Kampala yeah. and in Nairobi. Nairobi, those are tin, and so in Kampala, they're kind of tin buildings and so close together. And yeah, and. Um, What's mostly is the sewage running, you know, down the street. down the street, and um, they, um, yeah, those are those will be right next to a nice house. You know, there'll be a there'll be a slum here, and across the street there's a nice house, um, nice houses, and then there'll be, you know, in in the town, in the, in the city. Uh, it's kind of mind-boggling in that, isn't it? Because there's it's not like we're used to a areas that are nice and then areas that are poor. They're just sort of all mixed in. Um, <laughs> so what did you do in school school? Well, this year I got to actually teach, and that was hilarious. <laughs> so I, I'm in this kindergarten class and I'm doing sounds, and they speak English, 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 and I speak American English, and so here I am going, um, I've written on the board, the pig, um, the pig taps the top. Okay, I'll <laughs> give you that because, so I'm reading a pig 
ig, and the kids go, the, they sound it with me, just like that, the ig, and then they read it and they go, the p. Oh, <laughs> the p. Okay, so then we go on to tap. Okay, tap. We're reading that, and they're sounding it right along with me, and then they read it, and they read it top. And I go, okay, so the P, top, all right? Now we go on and we're at the word top. And I go, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sounding it to top. You know, this, I'm a slow learner. I just keep going to top. And they're doing that with me. And then they read it, and it's tope. And I go, oh, so the P, tops the tope. <laughs> and I just go, yeah. And I go, finally it's like, what am I doing here? Okay. And, and then they say, oh, they do more stories, more stories. So I'm writing stories on the board, and we're reading them. And then the kids are taking turns pointing to the words. <laughs> they don't have a clue what we're doing. And I'm just thinking, what on earth? So I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but anyway, then I went to the next one. So that class, I took a book. So I brought some books from Harvest. Had gotten um, Harvest School had gotten some books from Haynes. That they were going to just throw away. There was like scholastic little readers, and there was a lot of them. And I, so I said, you know, can I take some of those to Africa? I had a plan to take a whole bunch, but the swings way too much. <laughs> so I was sticking these little books in everywhere I can, and I had enough for about I think almost 20, 20 little readers, first and second grade level for these schools. So I took one of these, and they were all on uh, things like. Um, uh, Antarctic, animals in the Antarctic, um, animals in the rainforest, which were, I thought, well, that would be great. It'd be animals I know. No, it was South America. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, you know, that's what I wanted, just broadening their thing of the world, in a sense. And so I took this book on shipwrecks. So it's a little book, and it's just shipwrecks and treasure. So that would be fun, right? I'm reading it to the kids. And, and these are first grade, six years old, and I have just blank look, nothing. And so all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe they don't know what sink means. Maybe they don't know what float means. Maybe they don't know what a ship is. Maybe they have no kinds of different options. You know, they don't. <laughs> so all these things I'm thinking, okay, get, get thinking, Billy. So I, I asked them for a tub. Of, there was a tub outside. I said, could you put some water in that tub? And then we start getting, we do a science experiment, what sinks, what floats. And then we get a piece of paper, and this is our boat. And we put some coins on it. How many coins will it hold? Well, it sinks. You know, and then, and then I said, well, look, there's coins in the bottom. That's treasure. <laughs> and so, you know, um, so we kind of got, went through all the concepts that were in this book, and then I finished reading it to them. Well, then, then I went to the next group. Then, the, then I had a lesson plan. So that was take the tub, take all the sinks and float. And we did all that first, and then I read the story to them. And the second third grade got it a lot quicker. And then I got to the, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I hadn't gotten to the fourth and fifth yet. And um, they were just so excited. I mean, this class was like, they just couldn't get enough of it. And they were running out in the yard getting more things to sink and float to test. And, uh, and in one of the other schools where I did it, the teacher was going out. <laughs> <laughs> he got excited. I mean, they were so excited about this hands-on thing that the kids were understanding. And um, so and then so I finished that, and I said, the school ends at 4 o'clock. So I thought, surely my time is done. I said, well, is school over? No, no, no. The kids all said, no, 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 no. And so I said, well, all right, so I'll read another story. And then we talked some more about that. I said, well, is school over? <laughs> no, 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 no. And the teacher's getting this kind of this look. And I'm looking over at his watch, and it's uh, it's a quarter. It's like, um, it looked like it was a quarter to five. You know? And, and the kids were still saying, no. All right, one more story. And then it was five o'clock. And then Mary and Dallas were waiting for me to get there. You know, and I still had to drive to go. But it was so hard to leave them because they were just so excited with um, the story of just factual stories, these little readers. And and then all those kids, they had the books. They I mean, before I got to their class, they were reading the I had them in my lap, it was the break, you know, their lunchtime. They come over, they're getting the books out of my lap. They're reading them, the older kids. And um, they were just hungry, hungry for knowledge, hungry for those books. Wow. And um, 
But part of the problem with the little ones is they don't understand English. <laughs> yeah. They are they they don't understand English. So the three year olds, they speak to them in their language and then in English. And the four year olds they speak English first and then they translate. And then by um, five, the, which they call top class, they're supposed to be just doing English. But in the rural schools, they have to still do some interpretation for them. And then when you put me in there with uh, American English, you know, it's harder. They don't, uh, obviously, <laughs> after we did that reading, they had a, oh, brother. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but anyway, that's what I did. I just loved it. Yeah, so much fun. So these little kids, they don't pop, hop on a bus and come to school. They walk several they walk, hours, right? They get, yeah, whatever well, long it takes. One of the boys that that was, we were going to go see, but it was so muddy. He was an hour away, and so he would walk every day. Uh, one of the ones you guys sponsored, that she was going to go and visit. We just couldn't get there. The mud was this deep, and the, as the driver is going, he was a good driver. He's going up the hill. The mud just took them this way. And the scary part was, is all these little kids are on the side of the road and they're, they know there are white people in the van, so they are right there. They don't want to get away, they're not. And so the driver was worried about hitting the kids who were right by the side of the road, looking at all of us, you know? And that was the, yeah, that was the hard part. But, um, but the mud was mm, bad on that day and then it dried out and then it would have been fine. It's just we didn't get to go uh, go back again on the dry day. Yeah, yeah. You were a celebrity over there. Yeah. Now you're yeah. just a regular person. Yeah. Yeah. And then by the time I taught in the school for two or three days in that one school where the farm was, when we left the children, when they see the van, they'd run out yelling, Jaja Bili, Jaja Bili. And see, they even called me by name. <laughs> How can I say I said, Bill says, oh, great. <laughs> now you'll never want to come home. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Jaja means grandma. grandma. They, they wanted more stories about the crazy pig. They did. <laughs> <laughs> and then they tried one about an anthill, taking an anthill and making bricks. Because, you know, you could do that with simple words, and I thought they'd understand that. They didn't know how to make it bricks. <laughs> they, okay. they lived right there and they didn't know their own process for making bricks. I thought, all right, <laughs> I don't know. It's just a different world. You know, you, you assume there's knowledge there uh, that, that there isn't. <laughs> Holly, could you just tell us a little bit about the first school in the CSI compound um, in Kampala. Kampala and how big it is and what? Yeah, well, the um, there are so there's there's one um, there's two sections to that school, and so the one is a, a small uh, no it's not small they have um, they have two classes of four year olds two classes of well, they have more than that. Well, they've got several classes of four-year-olds, maybe four classes of four-year-olds, and like three classes of five-year-olds. And um, the four-year-olds are called middle class, and the five-year-olds are called top class. And the whole building is called the kindergarten. And then, so the kindergarten building, um, and that would be roughly, let's see, there's, mm, there was a, almost 200 kids in that part, in just that part. <coughs> and they do their chapels on their own because these are little kids, these four five-year-olds. And then um, up the hill, just a little bit, is the compound where um, this is a four-story building. So it's very much like the Kenya, that, that school in Kampala, that one was like the Kenya school. There are four stories um, and the classrooms all looked about the same. And that one goes to seventh grade. So they call it Form 7. And um, then, then it would be middle school, you know, or they would say maybe high school uh, after that. Well, actually, after that, after Form 7, they, they uh, would either go to a vocational school or they could go on for secondary learning and then eventually high school. So, um, and then college. But, if they, um, but they, that's all determined by how well they test on national tests. So um, that one had about... 
400 kids. I did chapel for the for that building, and there were 400 right. kids in that <coughs> room, and a whole bunch of them raised their hand to receive Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know about what that meant. <laughs> but they heard the gospel and they raised their hand to receive Jesus, and we prayed. And God used to take care of the rest because that could have meant that was their fourth time. They, you know, but they'd already done that. They just did it because I uh, was there asking them. You know, it could have meant a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. But it still um, was exciting to be able to teach that chapel. And then I taught um, chapel for uh, a couple hundred at the school for the farm. And again, um, I, yeah, there was, there's almost, um, not quite 200 of them. And um, that, that was fun too. So those were two. So that one's about four, and it's a boarding school. So the one in Kampala, mm -hmm. uh, the upper floor of it is uh, girls boarded. And uh, Tucker's and Eileen's youngest daughter is 12. She has boarded there. Not be, her house is just down the hill. It's immediately down the hill. Uh, but she will not, she just wants to be with all of her friends. So she has boarded at the school for probably several years. And then the boys boarding, they board um, uh, on the other, beyond the other side of the block um, where they have a baby school. And then they have a, um, rooms where they put the boys. And so, um, and it, they're wanting to do boarding, they're needing to do boarding schools in these rural schools because they're, they're so far out and the parents, if they, uh, it would just make more stability for them if they had boarding schools and vocational schools in the rural schools. But they're not quite to that place yet. So the kids that stay in the boarding schools, how often do they go home? They don't go home until the term is over. Oh. They don't go home on the weekends or anything. Even though they're in, uh, most of them are probably in town and could, um, they're not that far away. That's just, they just don't, because I ask that too. You know, they go home, if they go home on this weekend, but they don't. Yeah. No, they so they're cared for there? Yeah, they're cared for, there. and um, it cut, uh, I think that the, like the one of the teachers, teaches uh, that I've gotten to know pretty well in the kindergarten class, she's a top, top teacher, top class, uh, very good teacher named Lydia. Um, she takes three taxis and a boat a boat to get to work at 7.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. She has a little girl herself, but she has to leave like at seven, six o'clock in the morning to get to work before 7.30. And then school's out at four, but she's still got at least another hour and a half before she gets home. And in, and they were saying that if we're in the one school where we didn't go visit the homes of the children, uh, right. a suburb of Kampala. We didn't go visit the homes because they don't get home until after six, you know, or six thirty, and it just would have been too. So we gave the kids their food and their um, gifts at school and they take them home. Um, so that's a different, you know, that's different than our culture. And um, one in Kenya, the bus, the driver who was driving us, he said they have a house, they have a person that lives in their house and takes care of their child while both he and his wife work long, long hours so that they can get enough money, you know, that they can buy a better, have a better house, do more. So they're in that sick, but, for them, it's, um, and I think that's probably what happens with Lydia, uh, her husband works also, and they work in the church, that their younger child is probably in the care of someone else. Um, and you know, we might think about that, I don't want to do that, but they pretty much need to, to live in a, in, have the income in the city. Yeah. Yeah.